The votes are in and America has spoken. Most think the American midterm elections are a referendum on the sitting president. So is U.S. President Donald Trump feeling triumphant or deflated by the results? This year's election captivated everyone, not just in the United States, but around the globe. But why so much interest in this midterm election? And what does it mean for America and to our viewers around the world? Welcome to Plugged In, I'm Greta Van Susteren. On today's show, a look at the U.S. midterm election results, what they mean for the country and for the world. We will take a look at what were motivating factors that sent a record number of voters to the polls and what the winners and the losers might mean for President Donald Trump and his agenda. Was this a referendum on the Trump presidency? And do any of the results foreshadow what is to come in 2020? For answers, we will be joined by Representative Patrick Murphy, a Democrat and former congressman from Florida, by Justin Safey, spokesperson and top policy advisor for former Florida Governor Jeb Bush, by Washington Post columnist Karen Tumulty, who will join us later for a discussion on the broader implications of the election results. We will also have full election analysis from our very own Jim Malone and world reaction from our team of reporters from around the globe. We're live at Facebook, Facebook at Voice America, and we want your comments and questions. And it was like a presidential election, American voters turning down in big, big numbers with some states like Florida and Virginia reporting voter numbers not seen in over 20 years. All told, about 114 million Americans cast votes in the 2018 midterm elections. Now compare that to 1983 when in that election result that there were 20, about 20 million less. The result, opposition Democrats have taken back control of the U.S. House of Representatives dealing a political blow to President Donald Trump and his Republican Party. But as VOA Jim Malone reports, Republicans did better in the Senate races, expanding their majority in the Senate and setting the stage for more confrontational politics in the year ahead. At Democratic Party headquarters in Washington, Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi proclaimed a new day in the nation's capital. We will have a responsibility to find our common ground where we can, stand our ground where we can't, but we must try. A democratic Congress will work for solutions that bring us together because we have all had enough of division. Pelosi is now on track to become the next Speaker of the House, thanks to Democrats like Jennifer Wexton, who won a Republican House seat in Virginia. I've been saying since the beginning of this campaign that change is coming to, uh, to America and change is coming to Virginia 10. And that change came tonight. But Republicans expanded their narrow majority in the Senate with defeats of Senate Democrats in North Dakota, Missouri, and Indiana, where Republican Mike Braun emerged victorious. We as conservatives, being led by President Trump, We've got to prove why our way of thinking, why what works in the state of Indiana is going to work for the rest of America. The president's tough campaign rhetoric motivated voters on both sides, says analyst Rebecca Gill. It sort of um, polarizes folks and it gets uh, more people engaged on both sides. That was evident in voter interviews with a Trump supporter in California. I agree with many of the things he's done, not everything, but many of the things he's done. I think he's uh, got the best interest of our country uh, in mind, both domestically and also internationally. And with a Trump critic in New York. Yes, well, I hope, we're hoping that he has a bad dream from which we are just beginning to awaken. First of all, by taking the House of Representatives, and in two years, by taking the Senate and the White House. In the end, Trump was a key issue for both sides, says analyst Capri Cafaro. There is enthusiasm on both sides, which I think is why we are seeing significantly tight races across the board. For a closer look at some of the key races, we are joined at our wall by VOA senior political analyst Jim Malone. Jim? Thanks, Greta. I wanted to run down some of the key races on Tuesday. We had sort of a blue wave that took Democrats to the majority in the House, but it seemed to crash up against the red wall in the Senate. And speaking of the Senate, let's first take a look at a key race in the state of Florida. 
Republican Rick Scott, the sitting governor, with a lead over Democrat Bill Nelson, the incumbent. Nelson has asked for a recount, but if that lead holds up for Scott, that would be a pickup for Republicans in the state of Florida. Also in the state of Florida, a closely watched race for governor, Democrat Andrew Gillum losing narrowly to Republican Ron DeSantis, a Trump uh, supporter. Now, from Florida, we move to the state of Texas and the Senate race between Republican incumbent Ted Cruz. He narrowly defeats the Democratic challenger Beto O'Rourke, but O'Rourke is getting a lot of national attention because of his uh, support among younger people and his ability to fundraise. From Texas, we moved quickly to Missouri, another key Senate race, a place where President Trump campaigned extensively for the ultimate winner, Republican Josh Hawley. He defeated incumbent Democrat Clara McCaskill, a pickup for the Republicans. In Tennessee, another key Senate race, also where Trump is popular. This one to replace retiring Senator Bob Corker. The winner, Republican Representative Marsha Blackburn over the former Democratic governor, Phil Bredesen. Now we move south and west to the state of Arizona, a race that's still technically too close to call uh, between Democrat Kirsten Sinema and Republican Martha McSally. Uh, McSally has a slight lead, but it may be some time before that race is sorted out. And finally, a neighboring Nevada, a bit of good news for the Democrats and an otherwise difficult night in the Senate. That's where Jackie Rosen, a congresswoman, defeated Republican Senator Dean Heller, who was also helped by President Trump. And finally, one race the country has been looking at in the southern state of Georgia, the tough uh, gubernatorial race where Democrat Stacey Abrams is trailing Republican Brian Kemp. Uh, that race still hinges on some absentee and provisional ballots. Abrams was hoping to become the first African-American woman, African woman governor in U.S. history. So those are some of the key races, Greta. The big picture message to both parties. Look, we like to refer to red states and blue states, Republican red states, Democratic blue states. I think the results on Tuesday showed the red states are getting a bit redder and very supportive of President Trump. The blue states are moving away from Trump. They're getting a bit bluer. That has implications for the 2020 uh, re-election campaign for President Trump. Well, Florida is such an important state in every presidential election because it has so many electoral college votes and it's been the cause of so much consternation in American electoral history recently. Um, both those races you reported on, the Senate and the, and the governor's race, Republicans won, or at least maybe uh, Scott may, have, may win when the recount's done. But it's so narrow. Is that a particular message to either party? Yeah, it's a classic uh, bellwether state. And right now the Republicans are holding their edge. That is significant. Some of the polls uh, pre the election in Florida had Democrats slightly up. So I think there shows a reserve of strength, probably for the Trump message. I think that's what the president will take away. His hard campaigning for Republicans in key states in the final stages He's going to see that as the key to victory, and that will inform him about his own reelection strategy in two years. Jim, thank you very much. For insight and clues on how Tuesday's midterm elections might impact our global audience, we are joined by our team of VOA reporters around the globe. From our London studio, Henry Ridgewell brings us the British and European reaction. Aisha Tanzim joins us from Islamabad, Pakistan. Bill Eid is in Beijing to give us China's take. Steve Miller takes us to downtown Seoul for the view from South Korea. And for the latest from Capitol Hill, VOA's Katherine Gibson is in Washington, D.C. Let's start now across the pond with Henry Ridgewell in our London studio. Henry, can you hear me? Yeah, Greta, I can hear you oh, fine. Can you hear me? I can hear you, thank you. Um, so tell me, what's the reaction in London? Well, there's been widespread fascination with the developments in U.S. politics widely over the past two years. So that level of anticipation has really built up to these uh, elections uh, in America. But I think more broadly in Britain, there are very political reasons why these elections could be so important. Of course, Britain undergoing its own political turmoil as it leaves the European Union uh, and supporters of that process hope for a quick trade deal with America uh, after we leave the European Union. 
uh, and any blockages, any delays to that process, any delays to President Trump's wishes to create a trade deal uh, by a, a Democrat-controlled House would be seen as something negative in Britain. Uh, but for the rest of the EU, there are also trade worries, uh, fears of being caught in, in a trade war, just as China has with Washington, with threats of potential uh, tariffs on the export of cars from Europe, for example. Uh, and so there's real hope that uh, that can be overcome, although the German foreign minister said today that he believes the election results won't change President Trump's course and that Europe must be more united in its response to uh, his America first agenda. And then I think there's wider political, social uh, and cultural implications of the U.S. midterm results here. Uh, there are European parliamentary elections next year and fears on the political left of a surge in right wing populism. And there's hope among those on the left that perhaps the democratic gains uh, may put a global break on those populist gains. And we'll go over now to Aisha Tanzim in Islamabad. Thanks, Henry. I'm Aisha Tanzim in Islamabad. Local media here has not been paying much attention to the U.S. midterm elections because Pakistan's dealing with the aftermath of a crisis. Last week, Supreme Court here acquitted a Christian woman accused of blasphemy. Islamist groups that disagreed with the verdict called for nationwide strikes. There were protests all over the country, and in some parts of the country, they turned violent. Roads were blocked, highways were blocked, the entire country came to a standstill. Well, that part's over, but still, in this region, people are generally more interested in the U.S. presidential election than the midterm. The perception is that it's the U.S. president and not the Congress that drives foreign policy and relations with their particular country. So, for example, in neighboring Afghanistan and India in the last one week, they've paid more attention to the fact that President Trump has reimposed sanctions on Iran, which directly impact their lives, than the fact that U.S. is having a midterm election. That said, in this region, this midterm election is being viewed as a referendum on President Trump's policies. Now let's go to Beijing, where my colleague Bill is waiting to tell us how China sees these elections. Thanks, Aisha. This is Bill Ida in Shanghai, China. The world's second largest economy, which is a one-party state, has not been paying a lot of attention to the midterm elections. China doesn't give elections much space on websites or in newspapers, but state media does like to tailor results to fit the party's political messaging. With U.S.-China trade frictions rising and President Trump's allegations of meddling in the elections, along with a string of other moves directed at Beijing, China's focus recently has been largely on the trade war and pushing back against the Trump administration's policy of maximum pressure. What people here will be watching closely is the impact the results might have on the ongoing trade war. A more divided legislature could leave Trump more embattled, but few think it will change his China policy as Beijing's trade practices, which he calls unfair, is one of the few things Democrats and Republicans generally agree on. And now for more, let's go to my colleague Steve Miller in South Korea. Thanks, Bill. I'm Steve Miller in Seoul, South Korea. When it comes to the U.S. midterm elections, most South Koreans aren't paying too close attention. In fact, many I've spoken to don't even know they've taken place. South Koreans are focused on U.S. foreign policy, especially talks between Pyongyang and Washington to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. They're also focused on the tariff dispute between the United States and China because that can affect local exports and the local economy. However, they are not focused on House and Senate races or even gubernatorial races across the United States. Their eyes are squarely on the 2020 race for the White House. For more midterm election reaction, I'm going to now hand things off to my colleague on Capitol Hill. Thank you, Steve. I'm Katherine Gibson here on Capitol Hill, where all eyes are on the U.S. House of Representatives, which flipped to Democratic control after a record number of midterm election votes nationwide. But that election also created a split in the government that could complicate the Trump administration's agenda in the next two years. While the Republicans made gains in the U.S. Senate, the Democrats now control the House and could initiate investigations into the president. But the likely House Speaker Nancy Pelosi also signaled that she's willing to work with Republicans on a number of domestic issues, including prescription drug prices and infrastructure. 
What remains to be seen is whether there's still room for bipartisan cooperation here in Washington. And now, back to Greta Van Susteren. Thank you, Catherine, and to all our correspondents around the globe. Thank you all very much. What issues motivated Americans to get out and vote? Was it jobs, the economy, immigration, or was this a referendum on the president, or was it some combination of issues? Democrats voted in large numbers. Patrick Murphy, Florida Democratic Congressman from 2013 to 2017, is here to tell us why. He made a run for the Senate in 2016, but did lose to the incumbent Republican Senator Marco Rubio. He joins us now from Tampa, Florida. Welcome to Plugged In, sir. And tell me, why do you think that the Democratic vote was so heavy this week? Well, I think we saw a mixed message, really. I mean, it was a, you know, what was expected to be a Democratic wave was really more of a Democratic ripple. Uh, while Democrats did win back the House in pretty convincing numbers, uh, we'll see where that comes in. But it might, you know, if you add up all the Democratic votes for the, for the House versus the Republican votes, there's going to be an 8 to 10 percent advantage, which is pretty, you know, pretty big deal. But then you look at certain states like Florida, and that's a big disappointment. Uh, and, and other, you know, uh, letdowns in the U.S. Senate in Indiana and Missouri uh, and in Arizona, there was cinema going down. Uh, these were very hopeful seats for Democrats uh, to have lost. So not nearly as big of a wave as I was expecting or a lot of other Democrats out there. And I think uh, this really shows it, it is less about the issues uh, and more about Donald Trump. Tell me, um, what does this mean for the for for the American people? Beginning in January, the House will be the House will be Democrat, the Senate Republican, and the White House Republican. What can the American people expect to see different? You know, I'd love to tell you uh, that they can hope for infrastructure uh, reform and compromise, and some health care and education compromise. But unfortunately, I think that the narrative, at least from the media, is going to be gridlock and going to be the investigations possible impeachment uh, from the Democrats. Now, I will tell you from my friends in the Democratic caucus right now in Congress, they do not uh, want to move forward with impeachment. They don't want that word uttered by anybody. Uh, they don't want it to move forward unless there's Republicans involved and unless there's a smoking gun. If you listen to Leader Nancy Pelosi, soon to be Speaker Pelosi, uh, talk last night, it was about compromise, it was about infrastructure, it was about finding middle ground. That's what they want the narrative to be. What does Donald Trump do, right? Does he, you know, come out of the gate swinging, saying Democrats are obstructionists, or does he have extend an olive branch and say, "Hey, let's find some compromise"? Do you see this having any impact at all on foreign policy? There's so many things that are going on around the world that are so important to the American people, and the America and the United States is so important to so many nations around the world. Will this vote, the fact that now the Democrats have regained the House, does it make any difference? Do you think in foreign policy? I really don't think it makes a big difference, honestly. There were very few ads on it. There were very few conversations, very few debate questions about foreign policy. And therefore, I don't think Democrats were going to lead on that. They will focus on health care. They will focus on the environment, infrastructure, more of the domestic issues for now. That could change overnight. Uh, as we know with NAFTA, some of the other trade deals uh, out there, a lot of Democrats were in favor of TPP. That's obviously off the table. Can they bring back some of the trade negotiations? And simultaneously, what's going to happen with national security? Uh, pulling out of the Iran deal uh, was a big letdown for Democrats. Is there a, a, a negotiation that takes place there? Uh, and or do things get worse with certain Middle Eastern countries? where then Democrats would want to get more active and, and talk about perhaps the mistakes of the last you know, two decades and the war still going in Afghanistan. Uh, but for now, I don't think they're going to lead with that. Well, many people say that we've had legislative gridlock even before the Democrats who are about to assume control over the House of Representatives had, um, we've already had gridlock. Do you anticipate that President Trump will attempt to sort of bypass the legislative process and use more executive orders to attempt to, uh, uh, pr to promote his agenda? I, I do. There's no reason to think otherwise. Uh, we've seen a, a pretty dangerous, uh, concerning trend with presidents for decades now using more and more executive authority uh, to implement their legislation. That is, of course, a reflection of a Congress uh, that is riddled in gridlock because of the gerrymandering, because of the money, because of the more polarized media, uh, but also because Congress doesn't want to take a tough vote. Right when it looks look at something like uh, the uh, use of military force, the AUMF, 
uh, for example. A lot of members of Congress said, hey, we've got to do something. We need our voice heard. And then guess what? What do they do? Uh, they just punt the ball and let the administration do it. When it comes to trade, when it comes to foreign affairs and tough decisions, they want the executive branch to do that. So while members of Congress might kick and scream about you know, uh, the executive branch taking too much power, they don't have the courage to stand up and take these big votes. I don't see that changing in the near term. Congressman, thank you for joining us. Nice to talk to you, sir. Thank you. And for the Republican perspective on some of the key races, we are joined via Skype by Justin Safey. He's a former spokesperson and top policy advisor to former Florida Governor Jeb Bush. Justin, thank you much. Thank you for joining me. And tell me, why do you think it is that so many Republicans came out to vote in this midterm? Because midterms usually don't attract that many voters. They don't, but uh, there was a record number of voters in a midterm. There were so many people that came out and vote. I think there were a couple things. Uh, one, uh, the Supreme Court confirmation of Supreme Court nominee and now Justice uh, Brett Kavanaugh really uh, motivated. And the way he was treated by the Democrats in the Senate, there was a real anger and disgust amongst a lot of rank and file Republicans that otherwise probably wouldn't have voted in this midterm election. But they were so disgusted with what they saw, the unfairness of the process and the way he was treated, that they showed up to vote in numbers that I think cost the Democrats Senate seats uh, and also some House seats. Well, what we always like about legislation is that it's permanent unless it's reversed by Congress. Executive orders is by the stroke of a pen of any president who comes along. Uh, now that President Trump has lost the House as of January and he doesn't have a Republican House, um, do you expect that he will use executive orders more often than before, or do you expect that he will try to work with the Democrats and work with Speaker Pelosi, assuming she is the Speaker of the House come January? Yeah, I, I think he'll do both. I think that uh, it behooves both parties, both the Democrats, Speaker Pelosi and her colleagues in her caucus, uh, as well as the president, to make it a good faith effort to try to find common ground on some issues whether it's infrastructure, whether it's criminal justice reform, wherever they can find common ground, I think you'll see them make an attempt to do so. Hopefully they'll be successful. But at the same time, if there are things that they can agree upon, I think you're gonna see the president, President Trump, continue to do what he can in his power. He's certainly shown no reluctance to do that, especially most recently with sending it troops down to the border. Well, the, the new Congress starts in January. That's when the Democrats take, take the House. In the meantime, there's something called lame duck, and that's a period in which the president and, and, the, and, the, and Congress has an opportunity to do certain things before they change the power, so to speak, in January. I, I, do you think that this is going to be a robust lame duck and the president is going to try to fast pace his agenda before the Democrats take the House in January? And if so, how is that a message that he will work with the Democrats come January if he's trying to shove his message down in the last uh, few weeks? Well, that's a really good question. And so basically, the government runs out of funds, I believe, on December 7th. So they have to pass something. Congress is going to pass something uh, by December 7th. And the president has said, although he hasn't said it recently, that he wants more wall funding to be in that new uh, appropriation that comes on. It's going to hopefully happen by December 7th. So that's an issue, uh, Greta, to your point. He can insist that that happens. But you know, I think he feels that he has uh, public support to do that. So he might not uh, care too much if he doesn't get bipartisan support with that, because I think he feels that it's right to do, and he feels that he's got public support for it. Well, it's a fascinating midterm election. All eyes on it, certainly in the United States and around the world as we see what happens come January, and even in this lame duck between now and then. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Greta. The shifting balance of power in Congress could mean big changes for the Trump administration's policy agenda. These are policies that impact not only the daily lives of Americans, but also our partners, maybe even our adversaries around the world. Joining me from the Washington Post newsroom, Washington Post columnist Karen Tumulty. Welcome to Plug It In, Karen. Great to be here, Greta. Karen, what's the big picture message that goes out from the midterm elections, not even just for the United States, but around the world? What's the, what's the headline? You know, I think it's a mixed, it's really a mixed verdict here. Uh, we've, you know, it's like, it's like the blue wave met the red wall. Um, and I think that it's, as a result, probably going to be 
pretty difficult for our allies around the world to figure out what's going on other than, you know, probably a lot of gridlock out of Congress. Do you expect with the gridlock, I mean, that's, I mean, even, there was gridlock even before the uh, Democrats t won, won this election, which starts obviously not until January. There's gridlock. Um, do you expect that the president is going to use more executive orders? That's a huge controversy and has been not just this presidency, but other ones. I think so. And it's uh, it's in part because of the political situation, but we've also just seen this kind of long term institutional trend. And by the way, I think one that's that's quite unhealthy where, you know, as as you were discussing just a moment ago, Congress is ceding to the executive branch in the last in a series of presidents a lot of the, the power that is really supposed to rest in Congress. And I think this is going to accelerate over the next couple of years. Hey, doesn't Congress, at least the criticism of Congress ceding power like that is because Congress doesn't want to make the tough decisions because if you make the tough decisions, you're voting. If you're voting, your constituents back home are seeing how you're voting. They may not like how you vote, so better not to vote in essence. And they are also now incapable of compromise. Uh, it, Congress itself has become as polarized as we have seen it in over a century, which means there's not a lot of kind of incentive for people to do the kind of deal cutting and compromising that, that used to really be the lubricant of legislation. Well, is compromise not seen in the United States almost as a dirty word? It's a, a sign of weakness? rather than of strength, that even the voters are mad at their, at their leaders if they compromise because everyone is so fixated in positions, whether it be immigration, health care, or any of these issues, is that there really is a penalty to a politician who compromises? Yes, in part because the country itself has sort of sorted itself into very, you know, clusters of, of intense partisans. You know, the cities, people who live in the cities look at things one way, people who live in the suburbs another way. Uh, this, is, this is sort of accentuated by the way we draw the lines for the districts in which members of Congress run. But I think that basically it, it definitely, you know, it really reflects sort of where the country is. Uh, people in Congress now have become much more afraid of going home and losing a primary to a member of their own party than they are of these November elections. It's, we don't see these gigantic swings of, of seats normally. It seems like this election, midterm election, has gone on for two years um, since the 2016 presidential. Uh, are we now about to start 2020? I mean, we've all got midterm fatigue, I think, somewhat. But is, are people already starting to get revved up for 2020, these politicians? Oh, absolutely. I think the 2020 election campaign started about 11 hours ago. And, and the Democrats who are front runners, um, any familiar names for our viewers around the world? Who, who are they likely to see? Um, no, that's what's kind of interesting. Uh, the, there are not a lot. I mean, there, there's talk of, of Joe Biden getting into the race. There's, you know, Bernie Sanders trying it out again. You know, though, I would keep an eye on some of these governors. Uh, the Democrats have picked up a number of gubernatorial seats. And these are people who really have the potential to, if not run for president, really emerge as, as the sort of leaders and the leading voices in their party. Any, any election results shock you or stun you? Um, I, I wouldn't say shock or stun because I think a lot of us have sort of uh, decided we are unshockable after the 2016 election and Donald Trump won. But uh, I think that, I, you know, Democrats and I certainly I was in Florida and I would have given Andrew Gillum, the, the gubernatorial candidate down there, the edge. Um, I, I think that the underperformance of the Democrats in some of these statewide races uh, is sort of surprising to me, given the intensity of the Democratic base. Karen, thank you very much. Great to be here. That's all the time we have for today. Stay plugged in by liking us on Facebook at Voice of America. And you can also like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta. And do follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thanks for being plugged in.